This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. They usually uh, came as a result of conquest. I mean, yes. there's some like the Austro Hungarian Empire where there was just a lot of uh, sort of clever marriages. Um, <laughs> I'm generally a proponent of peace. I mean, ignorance is perhaps, in my view, the real enemy to be countered. That's the real hard part, not, you know, fighting other humans. Um, but all, all creatures fight. I mean, the, the, the jungle is a, you look at the, people think of, of this nature as perhaps some sort of peaceful thing, but in fact, it is not. There's some quite funny Werner Herzog thing mm -hmm. where he's like in the jungle, like saying that it's like basically just murder and death in every direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the plants and animals in the jungle are constantly trying to kill and eat each other every single day, every minute. So it's not like, uh, you know, we're unusual in that respect. Yes. We have much more of an ability to control our, our um, limbic instinct for violence than, say, a chimpanzee. And in fact, if one looks at, say, chimpanzee society, it is not friendly. I mean, the bonobos are an exception, um, but chimpanzee society is uh, filled with violence and it's quite quite horrific, frankly. That that's that's our limbic system in action. Like you don't want to be on the wrong side of a chimpanzee; it'll eat your face off and tear your nuts off. Yeah, chimpanzee society is a pr like a primitive version of human society. Um, it's, it's they're not like peace loving basically um, at all. Um, there, there's extreme violence, um, and then once in a while, some some somebody who's watched too many Disney movies decides to raise a chimpanzee as a pet, um, and then that eats their face or rips their nuts off or chews their fingers off and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's happened several times. Uh, ripping your nuts off is an interesting strategy for, <laughs> for interaction. <laughs> So it's happened to people. It's un unfortunate. Like that's, I guess, a one way to ensure that the other chimp doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. you know, contribute to the gene pool. Well, from a martial arts perspective, it's a fascinating strategy. <laughs> the, 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 the nut ripper. <laughs> I wonder which of the martial arts teaches that. <laughs> I think it's safe to say if somebody's <laughs> got your nuts in their hands <laughs> and has the option of rubbing them off, you will be amenable to uh, whatever they want. I think it, it, that that part of the world is is definitely like if you look up the there is no easy answer in the dictionary it'll be that like the picture of uh, the Middle East um, and Israel especially so there is no easy answer. Um, or what my uh, this is strictly my opinion of uh, you know uh, is that uh, the the goal of Hamas was to provoke an overreaction from Israel. Um, they obviously do not expect to, uh, you know, have a military victory, uh, um, but they, 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 they really wanted to commit the worst atrocities that they could in order to provoke the, the most aggressive response possible from Israel. Um, and then leverage that, uh, aggressive response to, um, rally Muslims worldwide, uh, for the cause of, uh, Gaza and Palestine which they have succeeded in doing. Um, so the, 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 the counterintuitive thing here, I think that the, the thing that I think should be done, even though it is very difficult, uh, is that um, I, I would recommend that Israel engage in the most cons conspicuous acts of kindness possible, every po everything. That is the actual thing that would thwart the goal of Hamas. So in some sense, the degree that makes sense in geopolitics, turn the other cheek, implemented. It's not exactly turn the other cheek, um, because I do think that there's, um, you know, th th I think it, it is appropriate for Israel to find the Hamas members and, you know, um, either either kill them or incarcerate them. Um, like, that's something, that's something that has to be done, because they're, they're just going to keep, keep, keep coming otherwise. Um, but uh, in addition to that, they need to do whatever they can. Um, 
there's some talk of uh, establishing, for example, a mobile hospital. I'd recommend doing that. Um, just making sure that uh, you know there's food, water, uh, medical necessities, um, and and just be over the top about it and be very transparent, so it's it, so that it can't people can't claim it's a trick. Like just put a webcam on the thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all twenty four seven. Deploy acts of kindness. Yeah, conspicuous acts of kindness. That that with that are unequivocal, meaning they can't be somehow, because Hamas will then the, their response will be, "Oh, it's a trick." Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to counter how how is it not a trick? This ultimately fights the broader force of hatred in the in the region. Yes, and I'm not sure who said it. So it's an, an apocryphal saying, but an eye for the for an eye makes everyone blind. Now, now that neck of the woods, they really believe in the whole eye for an eye thing. Um, but I mean, you really have, if, if you're not going to just outright uh, commit genocide, like against an entire people, which obviously would not be acceptable to, to, to uh, really shouldn't be acceptable to anyone, um, then you, you're going to leave basically a lot of people alive who subsequently, you know, hate Israel. So really the question is like, how, for, for every Hamas member that you kill, how many did you create? Mm -hmm. And if you create more than you kill, you've not succeeded. That's the, you know, the real situation there. Um, and it's safe to say that if, you know, um, if, you know, if, if you kill somebody's child in Gaza, you've, you've, you've made at least a few, uh, Hamas members who will die just, just, just to kill an Israeli. That's the situation. So, <clears throat> but, but I mean, this is one of the most contentious subjects one could possibly discuss. But, but I, I think if, if, the, if the goal ultimately is some sort of long-term peace, one has to be look at this from the standpoint of over time, are there more or fewer uh, terrorists being created? Let me just uh, linger on war. Yeah, well, war, it's safe to say wars always existed and always will exist. Always will exist. Always has, always has existed, and always will exist. I hope not. You and think always, it always will? Always, there will always be war. This question of just how much war, and and um, you know what, you know, there's this, there's this, this sort of the scope and scale of war. Mm -hmm. But to, my, uh, to imagine that there would not be any war in the future, I think, would be a very unlikely outcome. Yeah, you talked about the culture series. There's war even there. Yes, it was a giant war. The first book starts off with um, a gigantic galactic war where trillions die, trillions. Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess if we are able to one day expand to, you know, fill the galaxy or whatever, there will be a, a galactic war at some point. Uh. One of the things that does concern me is that there are very few people alive today who actually uh, viscerally understand the horrors of war, at least in the U.S. I mean, obviously, there are people in on the front lines in Ukraine and Russia who understand just how terrible war is. Um, but how many people in, in the West understand it? Um, you know, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, he was severely traumatized. Uh, I mean, he was there, for, I think, in the, for almost six years in the you know, in uh, East and North Africa and Italy. Uh, all his friends were killed uh, in front of him, and. Uh, he would have died too, um, except they randomly gave some, I guess, IQ test or something, and uh, he scored very high. Um, now, he was not an officer, he was, a, I think, a corporal or a sergeant or something like that, um, because he didn't finish high school. Um, he had to drop out of high school because his, his, his dad died, and he had to work to support his uh, siblings. Um, so because he didn't graduate high school, he was not eligible for the officer corps. Um, so... You know, he kind of got put into the cannon fodder category, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Um, but then, just randomly, they gave him this test. He it was transferred to British intelligence in London. That's where he met my grandmother. Um, but uh, he, he had PTSD next level, like next level. I mean, just didn't talk. Just didn't talk. And if you tried talking to him, he'd just tell you to shut up. 
And he won a bunch of medals, never never bragged about it once, not, not even hinted, nothing. I like found out about it because I, his military records were online. That's, uh, that's how, well, how I know. So he would say like, no, no way in hell. Do you want to do, do that again? But how many people, um, now he, he obviously, he, now he died, you know, 20 years ago, or longer actually, 30 years ago. Um, how many people are alive that remember World War II? Not many. And the same perhaps applies to the threat of nuclear war. Yeah. I mean, there are enough nuclear bombs pointed at uh, the United States to make the rubble, the radioactive rubble bounce many times. I think we shouldn't discount the possibility of nuclear war. Um, it is a civilizational threat. Um, Right now, I could be wrong, but I think the, the, the current probability of nuclear war is quite low. Um, but there are a lot of nukes pointed at us. So, and we have a lot of nukes pointed at other people. They're still there. Nobody's put their, uh, their guns away. The, the missiles are still in the silos. And uh, the leaders don't seem to be the ones with the nukes talking to each other. No. There are wars which are tragic and difficult on a, on a local basis. And then there are wars which are civilization ending or has that potential. Obviously global thermonuclear warfare has high potential to end civilization, perhaps, perhaps permanently, but certainly you know, to severely uh, wound and, and perhaps uh, set back uh, human progress by, you know, to the stone age or something. I don't know, pretty bad. Um, probably scientists and engineers want to be super popular after that as well. <laughs> They're like, you got us into this mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so generally, which I think we, we obviously want to prioritize civilizational risks over things that are um, painful and tragic on, on a local level, but not civilizational. Well, I think that what what is likely to happen, uh, which is really pretty much the the way it is, is that um, something very close to the current lines uh, will be how a ceasefire or truce happens. But you know, you, you just have a situation right now where whoever goes on the offensive. Um, will suffer casualties at several times the rate of whoever's on the defense. Because mm -hmm. um, you've got uh, defense in depth, you've got minefields, uh, trenches, anti-tank defenses. Um, nobody has air superiority because um, the, the, the anti-aircraft missiles are really far better than the, the aircraft. Like there are far more of them. Um, and uh, so neither side has uh, air superiority. Um, tanks are basically death traps. Um, just slow moving and they're, they're not immune to anti-tank weapons. Mm -hmm. So you, you really just have long range artillery um, and uh, infantry trenches. It's World War One, all over again. Mm -hmm. With drones, you know, throwing old drones, some, some drones there. Um, yeah, so it's wh whoever is you don't you don't you don't want to be trying to advance uh, from either side because the probability of dying is incredibly high. Um, so, in order to overcome uh, defense in depth trenches and minefields, you really need a significant local superiority in numbers. Um, ideally, combined arms, where where you you do a fast attack with aircraft. A, a concentrated number of tanks um, and a lot of people. That's the only way you're going to pu punch through a line. And then you're going to punch through and, st and and then not have reinforcements just kick you right out again. I mean, if you, I, I really recommend people read uh, World War One warfare in detail. That's rough. Um, I mean, the sheer number of people that died there was mind-boggling. Yes, I mean, the thing that 
the reason I've, I, you know, proposed a, a some sort of truce or, or, or peace a year ago was because I predicted pretty much exactly what would, would happen, uh, which is a lot of people dying for basically almost no changes in land. Um, and this, the, the, the loss of the, the flower of Ukrainian and Russian youth, and we should have some sympathy for the, the Russian boys as well as the Ukrainian boys, because the Russian boys didn't, didn't ask to be on their front line. They have to be. So um, there's a lot of sons not, not coming back to their parents, you know, and, and I think most of them don't, don't really have, they don't hate the other side. You know, it's sort of like, there's this saying about, like this, this saying comes from World War One. it's like young boys who don't know each other, killing each other on behalf of old men that do know each other. <sighs> the hell's the point of that? I think I would just recommend do not send the flower of Ukrainian youth to be, to die uh, in trenches. Uh, whether he talks to Putin or not, just don't do that. Um, whoever goes on the offensive will lose massive numbers of people. Um, and history will not look kindly upon them. Well, it's, it's worth reading that book on the, the, the uh, difficult to pronounce Thucydides trap, I believe it's called. I love war history. I like inside out and backwards. Um, there's hardly a battle I haven't read, read about. And, and trying to figure out like what, what really was the cause of victory in any particular case, as mm -hmm. opposed to what one side or another claimed was the, the reason. Both the victory and what sparked the war. And yeah, yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. So that Athens and Sparta is a classic case. The thing about the Greeks is they really wrote down a lot of stuff. They loved writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are lots of interesting things that happened in many parts of the world, but they just, people just didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't know what happened, or they didn't really write with de in detail. They just mm -hmm. would say like, we went, we had a battle and we won. And like, well, what? Can you add a bit more? Um, <laughs> the, the, the Greeks, they really wrote a lot. <laughs> They were very articulate on, it. they just love writing. So, mm -hmm. and we have a bunch of that writing that's preserved. So we know what led up to the uh, Peloponnesian War between um, the Spartan and Athenian alliance. Um, and uh, we, we know that they, they, for quite, they, they saw it coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Spartans didn't write, they, they also weren't very verbose by their nature, but they did write, but they weren't very verbose. <laughs> yeah, they were terse. Uh, but the, the Athenians and the other Greeks wrote, wrote a line. And they were like, um, and Sp Sparta was really kind of like the leader of, of Greece. Um, but, but Athens grew stronger and stronger with each passing year. And, um, and everyone's like, well, that's inevitable that there's going to be a clash between Athens and Sparta. Uh, well, how do we avoid that? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they actually, they saw it coming and they still could not avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, if there's, if, if one uh, group, one civilization or, or country or whatever um, exceeds another, sort of like if, you know, the United States has been the biggest kid on the block for, since I think around 1890 uh, from an economic standpoint. So the United States has been the economic, most powerful economic engine in the world longer than anyone's been alive. Um, and the foundation of war is economics. So now we have a situation in the case of China where the, um, the economy is likely to be two, perhaps three times larger than that of the US. So imagine you're the biggest kid on the block for as long as anyone can remember, and suddenly a kid comes along who's twice your size. Well, uh, the, the sheer number of really smart, hardworking people in China is um, incredible. Uh, there are, I believe, if you say like, how many smart, hardworking people are there in China? There's far more of them there than there are here, I think, in my, in my opinion. 
Um, the, uh, and they've got a lot of energy. So, I mean, the, the architecture in China that's in recent years is far more impressive than the US. I mean, the, the, the train stations, the buildings, the high-speed rail, everything, it's um, really far more impressive than what we have in the US. I, I mean, I recommend somebody just go to Shanghai and Beijing, look at the buildings and go to, you know, take the train from Beijing to Xi'an where you have the terracotta warriors. Um, China's got an incredible history, a uh, very long history. And, um, you know, I think arguably the, in terms of the use of language from, from a written standpoint, um, sort of one of, one of the oldest, perhaps, perhaps the oldest written language. And, and then China, people did write things down. So, um, now China, um, historically has always been, with rare exception, been internally focused. Um, they have not been acquisitive. Uh, they've, they fought each other. There have been many, many civil wars. Mm -hmm. um, in the Three Kingdoms War, I believe they lost about seventy percent of their population. So and, and that does, so the they've had brutal internal wars, like civil wars that make the U.S. civil war look t small by comparison. Um, so it, I think it's important to appreciate that China is not uh, monolithic. Um, we sort of think of like China as a sort of one entity of one mind, and this is definitely not the case. Um, from what I've seen, and I think most people who understand China would agree, that people in China think about China 10 times more than they think about anything outside of China. So it's like 90% of their consideration is, uh, you know, or is, is, is internal. <laughs> Uh, quote unquote, improving others through military might. The good news, the history of China suggests that China is not acquisitive, meaning they're not going to go out and invade a whole bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. um, now they do feel very strongly, you know, so that's, that's good. I mean, cause a lot of, a lot of very powerful countries have been acquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the U.S. is one of the, also one of the rare cases that has not been acquisitive. Like in, after World War II, the U.S. could have basically taken over the world and any country. Like we got nukes, nobody else got nukes. We don't even have to lose soldiers. Uh, which country do you want? Mm -hmm. And the United States could have taken over everything. Oh, it, at will, and it didn't. Um, and the United States actually helped rebuild countries. So it helped rebuild Europe. You know, helped rebuild Japan. Um, this is very unusual behavior, almost unprecedented. Um, you know, the U.S. did conspicuous acts of kindness, like the Berlin airlift, you know. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's, it's always like, well, America's done bad things. Well, of course, America's done bad things, but one needs to look at the, uh, the whole track record. Um, and, and just generally, you know, one, one sort of test would be, how do you treat your prisoners of war? Mm -hmm. Or let's say, um, you know, no offense to the Russians, but let's say you're in Germany, it's 1945. You got the Russian army coming on one side, and you got the French, British, and American armies coming on the other side. Who would you like to be to surrender to? Like, no country is like morally perfect, but I recommend uh, being a POW with the Americans. That would be my choice very strongly. <laughs> in the full menu of POW. Very US. much so. <laughs> and in fact, one of our Brown um, yeah. took, you know, a small guy, uh, was like, we've got to be captured by the Americans. Yep. And uh, in, in fact, the SS was under orders to execute Von Brown and all of the uh, German rocket engineers. Uh, and they narrowly escaped their SS, they, they said they were going out for a walk in the woods. They left in the middle of winter with no coats uh, and then ran like, and with no food, no coats, no water, and just ran like hell uh, and ran west. Um, and by sheer luck, they, I think his brother found like a, a bicycle or something and um, and then just cycled west as fast as he could and found, found a US patrol. Um, so, 
anyway, that's that's one that's one way you can tell morality is. Who, 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 where do you want to be a PW? <laughs> it's, it's not fun anywhere, but some places are much worse than others. So, um, anyway, so 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 I think America has been, uh, while far from perfect, uh, generally a, a benevolent force, um, and. Uh, we should always be self-critical and uh, we try to be better. Um, but um, anyone with half a brain knows that. So, so I think there are in this way, China and uh, the United States are similar. Ne neither country has been acquisitive um, in, in a significant way. So that's like a you know a, a shared principle, I guess. Um, now, now China does feel very strongly about Taiwan. They've been very clear about that for a long time. Um, you know, from their standpoint, it's it's it would be like one of the states is is, is you know not, not there like like Hawaii or something like that, but but more significant than Hawaii. You know, um, and Hawaii is pretty significant for us. So um, they, they they view it as 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 really the that there's a fundamental part of China. Uh, the island of Formosa, now, now Taiwan, that is um, not part of China, but should be. Uh, and the only reason it, it hasn't been is because of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Yes. China has been very clear that um, they will incorporate Taiwan uh, peacefully or uh, militarily, but that they will incorporate it from their standpoint, is 100% likely. Yeah. Well, and de-escalate. Absolutely. So, in, in, after World War One, the the they made a big mistake. You know, they, they basically tried to lump all the blame on Germany, um, and um, and and it, you know, settled Germany with. Uh, impossible reparations. Um, and, you know, really there was a lot of, there was a fair, quite a bit of blame to um, go around for World War I. Um, but they, they try to, you know, put it all on Germany. Um, and uh, that was, that, that laid the seeds for World War II. Uh, so, it's a lot of people, well not just Hitler, a lot of people felt wronged. Um, and they wanted vengeance, and they got it. People don't forget. Yeah, you you you, know, you kill somebody's father, or mother, or son, daughter. They're not going to forget it. They will want vengeance. Um, so after World War Two, they're like, "Well, that Treaty of Versailles was a huge mistake um, in World War One," and um, so this time instead of uh, you know, crushing the losers. We're we're actually going to help them with the Marshall Plan, and we're going to help rebuild rebuild uh, Germany. Uh, we're going to help rebuild, uh, or you know, Austria and the the other, you know, Italy and whatnot. So, um, and that was the right move. <laughs> Something must stop the the cycle of reciprocal violence. Something must stop it, or it will, you know, it'll 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 never stop. Just eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, limb for a limb, life for a life, forever and ever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I. Um, yeah, our, our AI Grok is modeled after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, one of my favorite books. Uh, which is it's a book on philosophy, disguised as a book on humor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would say that is that forms the basis of my philosophy, uh, which is that we don't know the meaning of life, but the more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness digital and biological, the more we're able to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. So I have a philosophy of curiosity.
Well, we are actually working hard to have uh, engineering, math, and physics answers that you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, so for the other sort of AIs out there, that, or these so-called large language models, um, I've not found the uh, engineering to be reliable. Um, and it, it, the hallucination, it, it unfortunately hallucinates mo most when you least want it to hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> so when you ask important, diff difficult questions, it, that's when it tends to be confidently wrong. Um, so we're really tr trying hard to say, okay, how do we be as grounded as possible so you can count on the results? Um, trace things back to physics first principles, uh, mathematical logic. Um, so underlying the humor is an aspiration to ad adhere to the truth of the universe as closely as possible. That's really tricky. It is tricky. So that's why, you know, you, you, there's always going to be some amount of error, but we want to um, aspire to be as truthful as possible about the answers uh, with acknowledged error. Um, so that there was always, you don't want to be confidently wrong. So you're not, not going to be right every time, but you don't. Be, you want to minimize how often you're confidently uh, wrong. And then, like I said, once you can count on the logic as being um, not violating physics, then you can start to, to build on that to create uh, inventions, like invent new technologies. But if if you can't, if if you if you cannot count on the foundational physics being correct. Obviously, the inventions are simply wishful thinking, you know, imagination land. Magic, basically. If an AI cannot figure out new physics, um, it's clearly not equal to humans, let alone, nor, nor has surpassed humans, because humans have figured out new physics. They've just, you know, physics is just understanding you know, deepening one's insight into how reality works, and then, um, then then there's engineering, which is inventing things that have never existed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the range of possibilities for engineering is far greater than for physics, because you know, once you figure out the rules of the universe, uh, that that's that's it. You've discovered things that already existed, um, but from that, you can then build technologies with that are really almost limitless in the uh, variety and cap you know, it's like once you understand the rules of the game properly, and we do, we, you know, with current physics, we do, at least at a local level, understand how physics works very well. Where our ability to predict things is incredibly good. Like quantum mechanics is, the degree to which quantum mechanics can predict outcomes is incredible. Um, that was my, that was my hard, hardest class in college, by the way. <laughs> my, my, my senior quantum mechanics class was harder than all of my other classes put together. Yeah, you have to test any, any conclusions against the ground truth of reality. Reality is the ultimate judge. Like physics is the law, everything else is a recommendation. <laughs> I've seen plenty of people break the, break the laws made by man, but none break the laws made by physics. And it's, it's also not, not the case currently that uh, even that its internal logic is not consistent. Um, so it's especially um, w with these, with the approach of like just predicting a token, predict a token, predict a token, it's like a vector sum. You know, you, you're summing up a bunch of vectors, but you, you can get drift. Um, so as those, a little bit of error, a little bit of error adds up. Mm -hmm. And by the time you are many tokens down the path, uh, you're, it, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So it has to be somehow self-aware about the drift. It has to be self-aware about the drift and then look at the thing as a gestalt, as a whole, mm -hmm. and and say, it does it have coherence as a whole? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when authors write books, that they, they will write the book and then they'll go and revise it, you know, taking into account, you know, all the, the end and the beginning and the middle and, and uh, rewrite it to achieve coherence so that it doesn't end, end up in a nonsensical place. Mm -hmm. Create a Close. draft and then, and, then you, and then you iterate on that draft yeah. um, until it has, has coherence. 
until it's, it's you know, it, it all adds up basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to understand intelligence, understand consciousness. I, I mean, there. I mean, there are some sort of fundamental questions of like, what is thought? What is emotion? Yeah. Um, is it really just one atom bumping into another atom? It feels like something more than that. Uh, so I, 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 I think we're probably missing some really big things. Um, like s some really big things. Well, some people would call it like a like a soul, you know, in religion yeah, it's a soul. Um, like you feel like you're you, right? I mean, you don't feel like you're just a collection of atoms. But on what dimension does thought exist? What dimension does do emotions exist? We feel them very strongly. Um, I suspect there's more to it than atoms bumping into atoms. And maybe AI can pave the path to the discovery of what whatever the hell that thing is. Yeah. What is consciousness? Like what if, when you put the atoms in a particular shape, why are they able to form thoughts mm -hmm. and take actions that, that and, and have feelings? And even if it is an illusion, why is this illusion so compelling? Yeah. Like how do why how, does this illusion exist? It, yeah. On, on what plane does this it, 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 this illusion exist? Yeah. Um, and that sometimes I wonder is, you know, e either perhaps everything's conscious or nothing is conscious. Um, one of the two. I like the former. Everything conscious just seems more fun. It does seem more, th more fun, yes. Um, but we're, we're composed of atoms, and those atoms are co composed of quarks and leptons. And those quarks and leptons have been around since the beginning of the universe. <laughs> Where are the aliens? Where are the aliens? That's one of the, the like the Fermi paradox question. Um, a lot of people have asked me if, if I've seen any evidence of aliens, and I've, I haven't, which is kind of concerning because then I think would I'd probably prefer to at least to have seen some archaeological evidence of aliens. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no proof. I, I'm not aware of any evidence of aliens. The out there, they're very subtle. We might just be the only consciousness, at least in the galaxy. Um, and if you, if you look at, say, the history of Earth, if one is to believe the archaeological record, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Civilization, as measured from the first writing, is only about 5,000 years old. We have to give some credit there to the ancient Sumerians, who aren't around anymore. I think it was the archaic pre-cuneiform was the first actual symbolic representation. But only about 5,000 years ago. I think that's a good date for, for when we're, say, civilization started. That's one millionth of Earth's existence. So civilization has been around, it's really a flash in the pan mm -hmm. so far. Um, and why, why have we, why did it take so long for, you know, one half billion years? Um, for the vast majority of the time, there was no life, and, and then there was archaic bacteria for a very long time. And then, you know, you had mitochondria get captured, multicellular life, um, differentiation into plants and animals, life moving from the oceans to land, mammals, um, higher brain functions, and the sun is expanding slowly, um, but it, it it will it will overheat it will it will heat heat the earth up at a, some point in the future, um, boil the oceans, and and Earth will become like Venus, where, where no life life as we know it is impossible. So if we do not become multiplanetary, and ultimately go beyond our solar system, um, annihilation of all life on Earth is a certainty, a certainty. Um, and it could be as little as, <laughs> on the galactic time scale, uh, half a billion years. You know, a long time by human standards, but 
that, that's only 10% longer than Earth has been around at all. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if life had taken 10% longer to evolve on Earth, it wouldn't exist at all. So yes. it, it seems like becoming a multiplanetary is almost inevitable. Unless we destroy, we this need thing. to do it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's not. I mean, I, I suspect that there, there, if we are able to go out there and explore other star, star systems, that we there's a good chance we find a, a whole bunch of long dead one planet civilizations. Yeah, they never p made it past their home planet. That's so sad. That's yeah, sad. Also I fascinating. Mean, I mean, there are various explanations for the Fermi paradox, and one is just the sort of there are these great filters which civilizations don't pass through. And one of those great filters is, do you become a multi-planet civilization or not? And if you don't, it's simply a matter of time before something happens on your planet, um, you know, either natural or man-made that causes us to die out, like the dinosaurs. Where are they now? They didn't have spaceships, <laughs> so. Well, they do run into a lot of other ants. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they have these ant wars. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good TV show. Yeah, they literally have these big wars between various ants. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, dismissing all the different diversity of ants. You should listen to that Werner Herzog talking about the jungle. It's really <laughs> hilarious. Have you heard it? No, I have not. Awesome. But Werner Herzog is a way. <laughs> 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 you, should play, you should play it for, for the, you know, as an interlude in the, yeah. <laughs> it's on YouTube. It's it's awesome. <laughs> I love him so much. Yeah, uh, he's great. Was he the director of Happy People, Life in the Taiga? I think also. He did that bear documentary. The bear documentary. And this yeah. thing about penguins. Yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> the depressed the analysis, the psychoanalysis <laughs> yeah, of a penguin. <laughs> yeah, the penguins like headed for like the mountains like that are like seventy miles away, <laughs> yeah. and penguin is just headed for doom, basically. <laughs> So aliens, I mean, I, I don't know. Look, I think it, the smart move uh, is just, you know, w this is the first time in the history of Earth that it's been possible for life to ex ex extend beyond Earth. Um, that window is open. Mm -hmm. um, now, it may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time. And it, it may be open now and then never open again. So I, th I think the smart move here is to make life multiplanetary while it is possible to do so. We don't want to be one of those lame one planet civilizations no. that just dies out. No. <laughs> okay. That seems irresponsible. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, if, 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 if I see the slightest indication that there are aliens, I will immediately post on the X platform yeah. anything I know. It could be the most liked, reposted post of all time. Yeah, I mean, look, we we have more satellites up there right now than everyone else combined. So, you know, we'd know we know if we've got to maneuver around something, and we're not I don't have to maneuver around anything. Yeah, I would agree that you, that God of the, the simulator or whatever the the supreme being or beings, um, uh, re re reveal themselves through the physics. You know, they're creators of this existence. And it's incumbent upon us to try to understand more about this wondrous creation. There may not be a master plan in the sense, that, so there's like maybe an interesting answer to the question of determinism versus free will is that if we are in a simulation, the reason that the, the, these higher beings would hold a simulation is to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, um, they don't know what happens. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't hold the simulation. Mm -hmm. So when, when humans create a simulation, so it's SpaceX and Tesla, we create simulations all the time. Um, especially for the rocket, you, you, uh, you know, you have to run a lot of simulations to understand what's going to happen because you can't really test the rocket until it goes to space and you want it to work. 
So you have to you have to simulate subsonic, transonic, hyper, uh, supersonic, hypersonic um, ascent, and then coming back, super high heating and um, orbital dynamics. All this is going to be simulated. So because uh, you don't get very many kicks at the can, but we we run the simulations to see what happens. Not if we knew what happens, we wouldn't run the simulation. Mm-hmm. So if if there's so whoever created this existence. Um, is they're running it because they don't know what's going to happen, not because they do. Well, the funny thing is that Uva Lillis, uh her title is Hatred Incarnate. Yeah. Um, and right now, I guess, <laughs> you can ask the Diablo team, but it's almost impossible to defeat hatred uh, in the eternal realm. Yeah, you've streamed yourself dominating tier 100 nightmare yeah, dungeons I can, and still. I, I can cruise through tier 100 nightmare dungeons like a stroll in the park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and still you're defeated by hatred. Yeah, I can, there's the, the sort of, I guess maybe the second hardest boss is Duriel. Duriel can't even scratch the paint. Mm-hmm. So uh, I killed Duriel, Duriel so many times. Um, and every other boss in the game, all, all of them kill him so many times, it's easy. Um, but uh, Uva Lilith, otherwise known as Hatred Incarnate, especially if you're a druid and you have no ability to go in, to be invulnerable, you, the, you, there are these <laughs> random death waves that, that come at you. Um, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm really, I am 52, so my reflex is not what they used to be, but I'm, I have a lifetime of playing video games. Um, at one point I was, you know, maybe one of the best Quake players in the world. Um, I actually won money for in, in, in what I think was the first paid esports tournament in the US. Um, we were doing, doing four person Quake tournaments and um, we came second. I was the second best person on the team. And uh, the, the, the actual best person, that we were, we were actually winning, we were going to come first, except the best person on the team, his computer crashed halfway through the game. Um, so. We came second, <laughs> but I got money for it and everything. So, like, basically, I got skills. You mm-hmm. know, albeit you know, no, no spring spring chicken these days. And um, the to be totally frank, it's driving me crazy <laughs> trying to beat Lilith as a druid. Basically, trying to trying to beat <laughs> trying to beat hatred incarnate in the eternal realm as a druid. <laughs> as a druid, and then if you <laughs> if you if you, if you <laughs> this is really <laughs> vexing. Let me tell you. Um, I would not recommend playing a druid in the eternal no. realm. Um, right now, I think the most powerful character in this in the seasonal realm is the sorcerer with the lightning balls. Mm-hmm. So the the sorks have huge balls in the, the seasonal. Well, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> so, 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 sorks have huge balls. Um, they do uh, huge balls of lightning. Um, I, I'll take your word for it. And it's actually in, in the seasonal realm that you can you can it's it's like pretty easy to beat uh, Uber Lilith with the, the because you get these vampiric powers that amplify your damage and increase your defense and whatnot. So, um, but really quite easy to, to defeat uh, hatred seasonally, mm-hmm. but to defeat hatred eternally, very difficult. Um, almost impossible. It's, Virgin and impossible. It, it seems like this is a, a metaphor for life, you know. Yeah. It's, I don't know, if I, it's, uh, it calms my mind. I mean, you sort of killing the, the demons in a video game calms the demons in my mind. Yeah. I, it, if, if you play a tough video game, you can get into like a state of flow, which is very enjoyable. Um, and, uh, but the, the, admittedly, it, it needs to be not too easy, not too hard, um, kind of in the Goldilocks zone. Um, and I guess you generally want to feel like you're progressing in the game. So um, a good video. And, and there's also beautiful art, um, engaging storylines. Um, and it's a, it's like an amazing puzzle to solve, I think. And so it, it's like solving the puzzle. Elden Ring the greatest game of all time. I still haven't played it, but to you. It's, Elden Ring is definitely a candidate for best game ever. Top five, for sure. 
I think I've been scared how hard it is or how hard I hear it is. So, but it is beautiful. Elden Ring is, feels like it's designed by an alien. <laughs> um, There's a theme to this discussion. In what it's, way? It's, it's, it's so unusual. It's incredibly creative mm -hmm. and the art is stunning. I recommend playing it on a, on a big resolution, high dynamic range TV even. Mm -hmm. Doesn't need to be a monitor. Just a, the art is incredible. It's so beautiful. And, and it's it's so unusual. Um, and each of those top boss battles is unique. Like it's like a unique puzzle to solve. Mm. Each one's different. Um, and the, the strategy you use to solve one battle is di different from another battle. That said, you said Druid on Eternal against Uber Lilith is the hardest boss battle you've ever. Correct. That is. Currently, the the and I've I've played a lot of video games because my, it's my primary rec recreational activity. Yes. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, <laughs> beating hatred in the eternal realm yeah. is the hardest boss battle <laughs> in life and in the video game. Metaphor. And I'm, like, metaphor. I don't know, it, I don't, I'm not top sure it's metaphor, metaphor, but it's it, it, it's. I do make progress. So then I'm like, okay, I'm making progress. Maybe if I just tweak that Paragon board a little more, mm -hmm. I can do it. I can just dodge a few more waves. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do it. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> I, 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 I have a feeling that at least, I, th I think... It's doable. Look, it's, it's doable, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the human spirit right there, to believe. Yeah. I mean, it did prompt me to think about just hate in general, which is, you know, you, 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 want, you want to be careful of the, one of those things where you wish for something that sounds good, but, in, but if you get it, it's actually a dystopian situation. So, you know, you could sort of run a sort of... Uh, hypothesis of like, if you wish for world peace, sounds good, mm -hmm. but how is it enforced? And, and at what cost is, is it, what, at what cost eternal peace? It might actually be worse to have eternal peace because of what that would entail. The suppression of everyone, it might be the suppression of progress. It might be an ossified society that never changes. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that there is an argument that you, you that if that if you wish for no war, you should be careful what you wish for. Because what's required in order for there to be no war might be worse than a little war. You know, there's actually a real drug called soma. There is. It, yes. <laughs> I'm like, Let me I take wonder, notes. Did they actually? Does... Yeah. It like integrates everything together. Yeah. Like the interface is one of the really cool things here. Yeah. Seems like a great job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you could say like, you could say like, no, I, no, I mean Soma from Brave, Brave New World. Because it, it thinks you mean you, you mean Soma, the real drug? Yeah. No, I mean Soma from Brain Beer World. Is it better to live in a world where everyone is happy all the time, even if that happiness, happiness is artificial? Mm -hmm. it's a good question. This is what I mean. Like, do you want, do you wish for world peace and, and happiness all the time? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Um, because that might be a society that is essentially sterile and ossified that never changes, that is ultimately doomed. This kind of tension between uh, I mean, this, the darkness I mean, and the light. It's, 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 this is a, not really a very good summary. Um, mm -hmm. It really gets to the point. It, this is not simply regurgitating uh, Brave New World, it's actually getting to the, the, the salient element of soma as a drug um do you do you actually want to be in a, a situation where everyone is happy all the time even though it's artificial 
Or is it better to confront the challenges of life and experience the full range of human emotions, even if it means experiencing pain and suffering? It pretty much nails it. In conclusion, Soma from Brave New World is a fictional drug that is used to explore some deep philosophical questions about the nature of happiness and the role of drugs in society. It's a powerful symbol of the dangers of using drugs to escape from reality and the importance of confronting the challenges of life head on. Nailed it. And the crazy thing is like, you know, we do have a real drug called Soma, which kind of does, is kind of like the drug in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, did they? They must have named. They must have named it after. Yeah, something. probably, probably. Yeah, some of the, the real drug is quite effective on back pain. So you know about this drug? I've taken this it. It's fascinating. Okay. Because I had like a you know squashed uh, disc in my C five C six. So it takes the physical pain away, but soma here is... it doesn't completely. It 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 reduces the amount of pain you feel, but at the expense of mental acuity. Mm. It dulls your mind. <laughs> just like the, just like the drug in the book. Yeah, and actually I was talking to a friend of mine um saying like would you really want there to be no hate in the world? Like really none? Like I wonder why hate evolved. Um I'm not saying we should amplify hate, of course. I think we should try to minimize it, but but none at all. Hmm. There might be a reason for hate. Well, I think it's helpful. That the tools of physics are very powerful and can be applied, I think, to almost any, really, any arena in life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really just uh, critical thinking. For something important, you need to reason with, from first principles and think about things in the limit, one direction or the other. So, um, in the limit, even at the Kardashev scale, meaning even if you harness the entire power of the sun, you will still care about useful compute for what? So that's where, I, I think, probably where things are headed from uh, the standpoint of AI is that we, we have a silicon shortage now that will transition to a voltage transformer shortage in about a year. Mm -hmm. Ironically, transformers for transformers. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need transformers to run transformers. Somebody has a sense of humor in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Fate loves irony. <laughs> <laughs> ironic humor. And an ironically funny outcome seems to be often what fate wants. Humor is all you need. I think spice <laughs> is all you need, somebody posted. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so so we're we're, we're have a silicon shortage today. Um a voltage step down transformer shortage probably in about a year, and then just electricity shortages in general in about two years. I, I gave a speech for the sort of world gathering of utility companies, electricity companies. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I said, look, you really need to prepare for a tripling of electricity demand um, because all transport is going to go electric with the ironic exception of rockets and uh, and, and heating um, will also go electric. Um, so energy usage right now is roughly one third, very rough terms, one third ele electricity, one third transport, one third heating. Um, and so in order for everything to go sustainable, to go electric, um, you uh, need to triple electricity output. So I encourage the utilities to uh, build more power plants and and also to probably have, well, well, not probably, they should definitely buy more batteries because the, the grid currently is sized for real-time load, which is kind of crazy because you know, that means you got to size for whatever the, the peak electricity demand is, like the worst second or the worst day of the year, mm -hmm. or you can have a, a brownout or blackout. And you know, we had that crazy blackout for several days in, in, in Austin. Um, so, uh, because the, uh, there's almost no buffering of energy in the grid. Like if you've got a hydro power plant, you can buffer energy, but otherwise um, it's all real time. So, with batteries, you can you can produce energy at night and use it during the day, so you can buffer. So I I expect that there will be very heavy usage of, of batteries in the future, because the, the the peak to trough ratio for power plants is 
anywhere from two to five. You know, so it's like lowest point to highest point. Yes, yes. I mean, electrification. I mean, electrification of transport uh, and and electric heating will, will be much bigger than AI, at least in the short term. In the short term, um, but but even for for AI, the, the, you, you really have a growing demand for electricity for electric vehicles, and a growing demand for electricity for to run the computers for AI. Mm -hmm. And so this is obviously leading can lead to a short, an electricity shortage. It will get solved. It's just a question of how long it takes to solve it. So it, it, at various points, there's a limit, some some kind of limiting factor to progress. Um, and when I, with regard to AI, I'm saying like right, right now the limiting factor is uh, silicon chips, um, mm -hmm. and that will we're going to then have more chips than we can actually plug in and turn on. Um, probably in about a year. Um, the the initial constraint being literally voltage step down transformers, mm -hmm. because you've got um, power coming in at 300,000 300, 300, volts, and it's got to step all the way down eventually to around 0.7 volts. So it's a very big amount of, you know, the voltage step down is gigantic. Um, so, and, and the, the industry is not used to rapid growth. Well, I mean, I've been pushing for some kind of regulatory oversight for a long time. I've been somewhat of a Cassandra on the subject for over a decade. Um, I think we want to be very careful in how we develop AI. Um, it's a, it's a it's a great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. Um, I think it, it would be wise for us to have at least um, an objective third party who can be like a referee that can go in and understand what the various leading players are doing with AI. And even if there's no enforcement ability, they should they can at least voice concerns mm -hmm. um, publicly. Um, you know, J Jeff Hinton, for example, left Google and he voiced strong concerns, but now he's not at Google anymore. So who's going to voice the concerns? So I think, I think there's, I, I, I like, I, you know, Tesla gets a lot of regulatory oversight on the automotive front. I and mean, we're subject to, I think over a hundred regulatory agencies domestically and internationally. So it's a, it's a lot. Um, you could fill this room with the old regulations that Tesla has to adhere to for automotive. Um, same is true in, you know, for rockets and for, you know, um, currently the limiting factor for SpaceX for Starship launch is regulatory approval. Uh, the FAA has actually given their approval, but we're, we're waiting for Fish and Wildlife to uh, finish their analysis and give their approval. That, that's why I posted, I want to buy a fish license on, <laughs> which also refers to the Monty Python sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you need a license for your fish? I, I don't know. <laughs> why, but according to the rules, I'm told you need some sort of fish license or something. We effectively need a fish license to launch a rocket. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second. How did the fish come into this picture? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, some of the things like that, that it's, I feel like are so absurd that I want to do like a comedy sketch and flash at the bottom. This is all real. This yeah. is actually what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that was a bit of a challenge at one point is that they were worried about uh, a rocket hitting a shark. Mm -hmm. And, um, now, the ocean is very big, and uh, how often do you see sharks? Uh, not that often, you know. As a percentage of ocean surface area, sharks basically are zero. And 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 so then we will, then we said, well, how will we calculate the probability of, of telling a shark? And they're like, well, we can't give you that information because we're, they're worried about shark hunt, shark fin hunters, uh, going and hunting sharks. And I said, well, how are we supposed to? We're on the horns of a dilemma then. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> then they said, well, there's another part of fish and wildlife that can can do this analysis. I'm like, well, why don't you give them the data? Like, we don't, they don't, we don't trust them. Like, excuse me? You don't, they're literally in your department. Yeah, but again, yeah. this is actually what happened. Um, and 
and and and then can you do an NDA or something? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they managed to solve the internal quandary, and indeed, uh, the probability of a of saving shock is essentially zero. Um, then there's another organization that I didn't realize existed until uh, you know a few months ago uh, that cares about whether you we would potentially hit a whale in international waters. Now, again, you look at the surface of the look at the look at the Pacific and say. What percentage of the Pacific consists of whale? Like, it'll give you a big picture and like point out all the whales in this picture. I'm like, I don't see any whales. <laughs> it's like basically zero percent. Um, and if our rocket does hit a whale, which is extremely unlikely beyond all belief, um, that is the the fate had it. In, that's a that whale has some seriously bad luck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the least lucky whale ever. Um, and um, I mean, this is quite absurd. Yeah, uh, bureaucracy, <laughs> the bureaucracy of this, however it emerged. Yes, well, I, I mean, one, one of the things that's pretty wild is um, for launching out of Vandenberg in California, we had to, they were worried about uh, seal procreation, whether the seals would be dismayed by the sonic booms. Um, now, there have been a lot of rockets launched out of Vandenberg, and the seal population has uh, steadily increased. Um, so if anything, rocket booms are an aphrodisiac. Um, based on the evidence, if you would correlate rocket launches with uh, seal population. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, we were forced to kidnap a seal, strap it to a board, put it, headphones on the seal, and play sonic boom sounds to it to see mm -hmm. if it would be distressed. This is an actual thing that happened. This is actually real. I have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love, love to see this. Yeah. There's, I mean, a, I'm sorry, there's a seal, a seal with headphones. <laughs> yes, it's a seal with headphones yeah. strapped to a board. And and like, the okay, now the amazing part is how calm the seal was. Yeah. Because if I was a seal, I'd be like, this is the end. <laughs> <laughs> They're definitely going to eat me. Yeah. Um, how will the seal, when the seal goes back to other, you know, its seal friends, how's it going to explain that? They're never going to believe them. Never going to believe them. That's why I'm like, well, you know, it's sort of like it's like getting kidnapped by aliens and getting an anal probe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you come back and say, I swear to God, yeah. I got kidnapped by aliens and they stuck an anal probe in my butt. And you're like, no, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's it seal some, it seal buddies are never going to believe him that he gets strapped to a board and they put headphones on his ears. <laughs> <laughs> and then let him go. <laughs> twice, by the way. We had to do it twice. They let him go twice. Where to catch the same seal? Well, no, different seal. Oh, okay. <laughs> did you uh, did you get a seal of approval? <laughs> yeah, <sorry>. exactly. <laughs> a seal of approval. No, I mean this is right. this is like I don't think the public is quite aware of the the madness that goes on. In order to run uh, like really deep intelligence, you need a lot of compute. So it's not like you know you can just fire up a PC and you're basement and be running AGI, at least not yet. Um, you know, Grok was trained on 8,000 A100s running at peak efficiency. Um, and Grok's going to get a lot better, by the way. We will be more than doubling our compute every couple months for the next several months. <laughs> I think there's some merit to open sourcing. I think perhaps with a slight time delay, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, six six months even. Um, I think I'm, I'm generally in favor of open sourcing, like bias was open sourcing. Um, I mean, it it is a concern to me that you know, opening. I you know, I was, you know, argue, I think I guess arguably the the, the prime, the, the, you know prime mover behind OpenAI in the sense that it was created because of discussions that I had with uh, Larry Page um, back when he and I were, were friends and you know, stayed at his house and uh, talked to him about AI safety. And and Larry did not care about AI safety, or at least at the time he didn't. Um, you know, and, and at one point he called me a specious for being pro-human. And I'm like, well, what team are you on, Larry? Uh, you're on Team Robot. <laughs> to be clear. And I'm like, okay, so at the time, you know, uh, Google Google had, had acquired DeepMind. They had uh, probably two thirds of all AI research, you know, probably two thirds of all the AI researchers in the world. 
-hmm. that basically inf infinite money and compute. And the guy in charge, you know, Larry Page, did not care about safety and even yelled at me um, and, and, and called me a specious and pro-human. So I don't know if you so know this about humans, they can change their mind and maybe you and Larry Page can still can be friends once more. I'd like to be friends with Larry again. Um, he he's he, he got uh, really the, the 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 breaking of the friendship was over OpenAI, um, and specifically, um, I think the, the the key moment was uh, recruiting Ilya Sitskaya. Um So, I love Ilya. He's so brilliant. Ilya's good, good human, uh, smart, good heart, um, and um, that was a, that was a tough recruiting battle. Um, it was mostly Demis on one side and me on the other, both trying to recruit Ilya. And Ilya went back and forth. You know, he was going to stay at Google, then he was going to leave, then he was going to stay, then he would leave. And and finally, he he did agree to join OpenAI. Uh, that was one of the toughest recruiting battles we've ever had. And but that that was really the the linchpin for OpenAI uh, being successful. And I was, you know, also instrumental in recruiting a number of other people. And I provided all of the funding in the beginning, um, over forty million dollars, um, and the name. <laughs> uh, the The open and open AI is supposed to mean open source, and it was created as a non profit open source, and now it is a closed source for maximum profit, which I think is not good karma. <laughs> like I said. I'd like to be friends again with Larry. I haven't seen him in ages. Um, and we were friends for a very long time. I met I met Larry Page before he got funding for Google. Or actually, I guess, before he got venture funding. I think he'd, he got the first like 100K from, wow. I think, Bechtel's Heim or someone. Um, it's wild to think about all that happened. And you've guys known each other that whole time. Just 20 yeah, years. Yeah, since maybe 98 or something. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy yeah. how much has happened since then. Yeah, 25 years. A lot has happened since then. But you're seeing the tension there, like maybe delayed open source. Delayed, I, yeah. Like what is the source that is open? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's basically, it's a giant CSV file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a bunch of numbers. Yep. Um, what do you do with that giant file of numbers? You know, how do you run... Like the amount of actual, the, the lines of code is very small. Mm -hmm. um, and and most of the work, um, the software work is in the, in the curation of the data. So it's like trying to figure out what data is separating good data from bad data. Like, um, like you can't just crawl the internet because there's a lot of junk out there. Mm -hmm. um, a huge percentage of websites have more noise than signal. You know, they're, they're or because they're, just used for search engine optimization. They're literally just scam websites. So, um. Yeah, I think the signal noise could be greatly improved. I mean, I, really, all of the posts on the X platform uh, should be AI recommended, meaning like we should populate a vector space around any given post, uh, compare that to the vector space around any user, and match the two. Mm -hmm. um, Right now, there is a little bit of AI used for the the, the recommended posts, but it's mostly heuristics. Um, and if there's a reply, where the, the reply to a post could be much better than the original post, but it will, but according to the current rules of the system, get almost no attention compared to a primary post. A little. There's a little bit. Um, but it needs to be entirely that. Like the, at least the, in the like, if if you explicitly follow someone, that's one thing. But if you, in terms of what is recommended mm -hmm. uh, from people that you don't follow, that should all be AI. Okay. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff on the system, and and I think, but I think it, right now it's it's not currently good at recommending things that from accounts you don't follow. Yeah. Um. Or, or where there's more than one degree of separation. So, you know, it's it's pretty good if, if there's at least like some commonality between 
someone you follow liked something um, or reposted it or commented on it or something like that. Um, but if, if, if there's no car, let's say somebody posts something really interesting, uh, but you have no followers in common, mm -hmm. you would not see it. Interesting. And then, as you said, reply, like replies might not surface Re either. Replies basically never get seen because they're never, they're, they're currently, I'm not saying it's correct, I'm saying it's incorrect. Uh, re replies have um, you know, a couple of magnitude less importance than primary posts. Do you think this can be more and more converted into end-to-end -end neural net? Yeah, yeah. That's what it should be. So you... you well, the recommendations it should be purely a vector correlation. Like, mm -hmm. there's a series of vectors, you know, just basically pra parameters, vectors, whatever you want to call them. Um, but, but sort of things that the system knows that you like. Um, in this, like, maybe there's like several hundred sort of vectors associated with each user account. And then uh, any post in the system, um, whether it's video, audio, short post, long post. The, the reason I, by the way, I want to move away from tweet is that, you know, people are posting like two, three hour videos on the site. That's not a tweet. Like, it's a very, yeah. they'll be like, tweet for th yeah. two hours? Come on. Do a tweet made sense when it was like 140 characters of text. Because mm -hmm. it's like a bunch of tweet, 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 like little birds tweeting, um, but when you've got long form content, it's no longer a tweet. Yeah. Um, so a movie is not a tweet, and like you know, Apple, for example, posted like the entire episode of the Silo, the entire thing, mm -hmm. on our platform. And by the way, it was, the, it was their number one social media thing ever in engagement of anything on any platform ever. So it was a great idea. And by the way, I, don't, I just learned about it afterwards. I was like, hey, wow, they po posted an entire hour-long episode of... So, no, that's not a tweet. <laughs> that, that's a, you know, it's a video. Yeah, I mean, right now it's it's a hodgepodge for that reason. It's... it's, um, But, you know, like if, let's say, in the ca case of Apple posting like a, an entire episode of, of their series, pretty good series, by the way, this silo. Um, I watched it. Um, so um, th there's going to be a lot of discussion around it. So that you've you've got a lot of context. Mm -hmm. People commenting, they like it, they don't like it, or they like this, or the you know, and and you can then populate the vector space based on the context of of all the comments around it. So even though it's a video, uh, there's a lot of information around it that that allows you to populate the vector space of that that uh, hour long video. Um, and then you can obviously get more sophisticated by having the AI actually watch the movie. Yeah, right. And tell you if you're going to like the movie. Mm -hmm. Convert the movie into like, yeah, into a language essentially. Yeah, analyze this language. movie, mm -hmm. and just like your movie critic uh, or TV series, and um, and then recommend based on after it what after it watches the movie, just like a friend can tell you if a friend knows you well, mm -hmm. a friend can recommend a movie and uh, with high probability that you'll like it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you you want ads that are advertising that is um, if, if if it's for a product or service that you that you actually need when you need it, it's it's content. Mm -hmm. um, and then even if it's not something that you need when you need it, if it's at least aesthetically pleasing and entertaining, you know, it could be like a Coca Cola ad, like you know, they, they they do. They actually run a lot of great ads on the on the X system, um, and um, McDonald's does too. And and uh, you know, it's, it's that they can do. You can do something that's like, well, this is this is just a cool thing, um, and um, you know. So you're not you're, basically the question is, do you regret seeing it or not? Mm -hmm. And if you don't regret seeing it, it's a win. <laughs> Attention is a big, a big factor. Attention. So oh. that's that's why it's like it's it's it is actually better to do things that are uh, long form on the system because it's it basically is tallying up how many user seconds. Uh, you know, users were interested in this thing for how many seconds. So if it's a really short thing, well, they will be less. Like if it's a link leading out of the system, which we're not opposed to at all, it just is going to have fewer user seconds than if that article was posted on the X platform.
exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I, have happiness. With, I have a joke with a friend of mine, like, well, you need this drug called regretamine. You just take one, one pillar, one, one dose of regretamine and all your regrets are gone. <laughs> yeah. wait do you want to have regrets though so then i'm like yeah. mm. if you want to have regrets if you don't regret anything was was anything meaningful okay let's let's, let's type in you sound like a hostage <laughs> 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 what do you really think Funny mode or is this still this is funny, funny mode? mode. This is fun. Yes, this is fun mode. Should be funnier. Funnier. <laughs> Increase. Go to. It, it really sounds like a hostage with a gun to the head. I applaud the People's Republic of North Korea <laughs> and everything they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, our goal is to be as even-handed and fair as possible. You know, whether some is right, left, independent, whatever the case may be, um, that um, the platform is. As fair and and, and le as much of a level playing field as possible, and now in the past t Twitter has not been um, because Twitter was uh, controlled by far left activists. Uh, objectively, they they would describe themselves as that. Um, so um, you know, so so if some of people are like, well, has it moved to the right? Well, it's moved to the center. So from the mm -hmm. from the perspective of the far left, yes, it has moved to the right because everything's to the right from the far left. Um, but no one on the far left that I'm aware of has been suspended or you know, banned or deamplified. Um, so, you know, but we're, we're trying to be inclusive for the whole country and, and for, you know, for other countries too. Um, so there's a diversity of viewpoints and free speech only matters um, if people you don't like are allowed to say things you don't like, because uh, if that's not the case, you don't have free speech and it's only a matter of time before uh, the censorship just turned upon you. Think? Truth Social is a funny name. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, every time you post on Truth Social. I mean, he, 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 I think he owns a big part of Truth. Mm -hmm. So, Truth Social. To yeah, Truth Social. He's not that Truth is a concept. <laughs> he owns Truth. Hope you bought it. <laughs> um, so I think, I think uh, Donald Trump, I think he owns uh, a, big, a big part of Truth Social. So... Um, you know, if, if, if he does want to post on the X platform, we would allow that. Um, you know, we, we obviously must allow a presidential candidate to post on our platform. Yeah, it's great. Um, in fact, I, the, I mean, no, no system is going to be perfect, but the, the batting average of community notes is incredibly good. I've, I've actually, frankly, yet to see an incorrect note that survived for more than a few hours. How do you explain why it works? Yeah, so the, the 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 magic of community notes is it requires people who have historically disagreed in how they have rated notes in order to um, write a note or rate you know and you you have to rate many notes mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we could, we actually do use AI here so we populate a vector space around. Um, how somebody has, has rated notes in the past. So it's not as simple as left or right, because there are many more, life is much more complex than, than left or right. Um, so there's a, a bunch of correlations in how you would, how you rate community notes posts, mm -hmm. um, community notes. So um, then uh, in order for a community note to actually be shown, um, people who historically have disagreed on a subject must agree in order for a note to be shown. Um, that's the essential magic of it. Yeah, it, it, it kind of makes sense that that if people who, who in the past have disagreed agree about something, um, it's probably true. Wikipedia is very hierarchical, uh, whereas um, community notes is inherently not. Uh, there is no hierarchy. Like I, and, and the, the acid test is, um, I can't change a community note if somebody put a gun to my head. So, um, and, and any, ch and community, community notes uh, has, all the code is open source, 100%. All the data is open source, 100%. So you can completely recreate any note in the system independently. Um, so if there was any interference, you'd notice immediately. 
Well, the first part, uh, I did actually have the funding secured, um, and there was a, a, a big trial in San Francisco, a big civil trial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the jury found me not guilty. Unanimous finding of a San Francisco jury. And here it's kind um, of implying that it was not in fact secured. I think it's taking things from the press. Um, yeah, that is not correct. The, the, the reason um, I agreed to, to the fine for the SEC is not because the SEC was correct. There were, that, that was extremely bad behavior by the SEC, corruption, frankly. Um, and, uh, but, but if, um, if I did not agree to pay, pay the fine, um, Tesla would have gone bankrupt immediately. So I was told by our CFO that uh, the banks would, just, would, would immediately suspend our uh, lines of credit. Uh, and if they suspend our lines of credit at that time, we would have gone bankrupt instantly. So, so we would have, there would never have been an opportunity for a trial because Tesla would be dead. So really, the, the, if, if, this is like someone holding a gun to your kid's head and saying, pay $20 million and, and, and admit to, this is like a hostage negotiation. Um, it should be. But, but not once did the SEC go after any of the hedge funds. Uh, who were nonstop shorting and distorting Tesla. Not once. They would lie flat, the hedge funds would lie flat out on TV for their own gain at the expense of retail investors. Not once, literally a thousand times. Not once did the SEC pursue them. How do you explain this failure? On the the incentive structure is, is messed up because the, the, the lawyers at the SEC are not paid well. They... They, it's a fairly low paying job, but they're, what they're looking for is a trophy from, from the SEC that they, they're looking for something they put on basically the LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, from that, they can get a job at a high paying law firm. That's exactly what the, uh, lawyer here did. Um, and, 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 and the reason they don't attack the, the hedge funds is because those hedge funds employ those law firms and they know if they attack the hedge funds, they're affecting their, pure, their future career prospects. So they sell small investors down the river for their own career. That's what actually happens. Regulatory capture. Regulatory capture. Yeah, not good. So the, the only reason I accepted that thing, well, technically was a, um, not an admission, it's neither ad, admit nor deny guilt. Uh, but the only reason I agreed to that at all was because I was told Tesla would, would be bankrupt otherwise. So if, if, there, if there was an SEC investigation like this, banks would suspend funding, we're bankrupt immediately at the time. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a much stronger position. Take that, Grok. Yes, unfortunately, it's, Grok is, is taking too much from the conventional media. Um, also, that guy was not a cave diver. That's false. There was no settlement. There was a court case, mm -hmm. which he, which the guy who was not a cave diver and where and, and played, did, was not part of the rescue team, um, filed a lawsuit against me and lost, and he received nothing. So in this case, it is wrong. Uh, it is also, uh, I guess, taking this from the conventional media. Actually, there's an interesting question here. I mean, this is a, these are public court cases. Yes. Both, both the the the, the SEC civil case. Uh, where th the civil complaints on the SEC guys lost unanimous jury verdict in San Francisco. They picked San Francisco because they thought it was the mo place I was most likely to lose. And a unanimous verdict in my favor. The LA trial was also, they picked, the, 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 they they picked that venue because they thought it was, I was most likely to lose. Unanimous verdict in my favor. It, both cases I won. Yeah. We need to add the training set of the actual legal decisions. Uh, if so, we, that is a note. This is actually helpful um, because if you actually read the uh, court, which are public, which are public, yeah, the court conclusions, they're completely the opposite of what the media wrote. So always striving for like the ground truth. Yeah. Beyond what the, did the, the judge reporting. actually write? The, what 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 did the jury and the judge actually conclude? And in both cases, they found me innocent. And and like the, that's after the jury shot for the 
trying to find the venue where I'm most likely to lose. No, I mean, this is, obviously it can be a much greater, better critique than this. Um, I mean, I've been far too optimistic about uh, autopilot. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I'm pathologically optimistic on schedule. This is this is this is true. But um, while I am sometimes late, I always deliver in the end. Uh, well, yeah, I guess if you, if you consider fighting the, the woke mind virus, which I consider to be a civilizational threat, to be political, then yes. So basically, going into the the battle, the battleground of politics. I mean, is there a part of you that regrets yes, that? Yes, I don't know if this is necessarily is sort of one candidate or another candidate, but it's, um, I'm generally against things that are anti-meritocratic uh, or where there's an attempt to suppress discussion, um, where ev even discussing a topic is, uh, you know, not allowed. Um, the book Bind Virus is communism rebranded. <laughs> The woke is left, then I suppose that would be true. Um, but I'm not sure. I think there are aspects of the left that are that are good. I mean, if you're in favor of, you know, uh, the the environment, um, or, you know, if you want to have a positive future for humanity, if you believe in empathy for your fellow human beings, um, you know, being kind and not cruel, I, I, whatever those values are. You said that you were previously left or center left. What would what would you like to see in order well, for you to sort of voting for Democrats again? No, I, I would say that I would be um, probably left of center on social issues, probably a little bit right of center on economic issues. Um, I'm always in favor of humor. That's why we have a funny mode. But good vibes, camaraderie, humor. You know, like. Uh, like friendship. Yeah, I don't. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know AOC. I've, I, you know, was um, I've only been at one. Look, I was at the the Met Ball when she was when she attended, um, and she she was wearing this dress, uh, but I can only see one side of it, so it it, it looked like eat the itch, but I mm. I, I don't know. What the... Petrify is a spell in the Druid tree. What does it do? Petrify. It, put... <laughs> <laughs> it, turn, <laughs> it, it turns it turns the monsters into stone. <laughs> yes, it can be definitely stressful at times. Well, how do you know who you, who you can trust in work and personal life? I mean, I guess you look at somebody's track record over time, and if they've Data. got a, tr you know, I guess you kind of use your neural net to assess. You know, someone. I'm, you know, to be frank, I mean, I've, I've almost never been betrayed. It's very, very rare. So, you know, for what it's worth. I, I don't think I will be cynical. In fact, I think, um, you know, I, my feeling is that one should be, be you know, Never trust a cynic. The reason is that um, cynics excuse their own bad behavior by saying everyone does it mm -hmm. they're, because they're cynical. So I always be, it's a red flag if someone's a cynic, a true cynic. Yeah, there's a degree of projection there that's always fun to watch from the outside and enjoy the, well, the it's hypocrisy. Just, if, but, but I, this is an, an important point that I think people who are listening should bear in mind. If if somebody is cynical, meaning that they see bad behavior in everyone, um, it's easy for them to excuse their own bad behavior hmm. by saying that, well, everyone does it. But it's not true. I think most people are kind of medium good. <laughs> I, mean, I find the X platform to be less negative than the legacy media. You know, I mean, if if you read sort of a sort of conventional newspaper, it's just it makes you sad. Yeah. Frankly, um, whereas I'd say on the X platform, 
I, I mean, I really get more laughs per day on X than everything else combined from humans, you know. Yeah, mainstream media is almost relentlessly negative about everything. Um, it's, I mean, re really, the conventional news tries to answer the question, what is the worst thing that happened on Earth today? Mm -hmm. And it's a big world. So uh, yeah. on any given day, something bad has happened. And a generalization of that, what is the worst perspective I can take on a thing that happened? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know, there's just a strong negative bias in the news. Um, I, I mean, I think there's what, the, what a possible explanation for this is evolutionary. Um, where, you know, bad news historically would be p potentially fatal. Like uh, there's lion over there or there's some other tribe that wants to kill you. Um, good news, you know, like we found a, a patch of berries is nice to have, but not essential. Well, I mean, the really wild thing about the end-to-end -end training is that it, like, it learns to read, like it, it can read signs, but we never taught it to read. So, yeah, we never taught it what we never taught it what a car was, or what a person was, or a bike cyclist. Uh, it learnt what what all those things are, what all the objects are on the road um, from video, just from watching video, just like humans. I mean, humans are photons in, control controls out. Like the vast majority of information reaching our brain is from our eyes. Um, and you say, well, what's the output? The output is our motor signals to our you know, sort of fingers and mouth in order to communicate. Um, photons in, controls out. The same is true of the car. It finds order in, in, in these things. Um, mm -hmm. It finds uh, correlative clusters. They're both headed towards AGI. Um, the Tesla approach is much more computer efficient. It had to be because we were constrained on this. This, you know, we only have a hundred watts, um, and an int eight computer, one hundred and forty four trillion operations per second, which sounds like a lot, but is kind of small potatoes these days. At int eight. But it's understanding the world at a date. It's only 256 values. They're both um, going to understand the world, but I think Tesla's approach is fundamentally more computer efficient. Mm -hmm. It had to be, there was no choice. Like our brain is very computer efficient, very, very energy efficient. So think of like, what, what is our brain able to do? Um, you know, there's only about 10 watts of higher brain function, not counting stuff that's just used to control our body. Um, the thinking part of our brain is less than 10 watts. Um, and that 10, those 10 watts can still produce a much better novel than a 10 megawatt GPU cluster. So there's a six order of magnitude difference there. Um, I mean, the, the AI has thus far gotten to where it is via brute force just throwing massive amounts of compute and, and massive amounts of power at it. So this is not where, where it will end up. Um, you know, in general, with any given technology, you first try to make it work and then you make it efficient. So I think we'll find over time that these models get smaller, are, are able to do, produce a sensible output with far less compute far less power. Um, Tesla is arguably ahead of the game on that front because um, it has, we've just been forced to uh, try to understand the world with 100 watts of compute. Um, and there are a bunch of sort of fundamental functions that we kind of forgot to include. So we have to run them in a bunch of things in emulation. Um, we fixed, fixed a bunch of those with hardware four and then hardware five will be even better. Um, 
but I, it, it does appear at this point uh, that the car will be able to drive better than a human, even with hardware three at, and 100 watts of power. And really, if we really optimize it, it could be probably less than 50 watts. <laughs> I was surprised at the fact that we had to develop every part of the robot ourselves, um, that there were no off-the-shelf motors, electronics, sensors, like we had to develop everything. Um, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't actually find a source of electric motors for any amount of money. Um, yeah designed from scratch we tried hard to find anything that was because you think of how many electric motors are made in the world mm -hmm. there's like tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of electric motor designs um none of them were suitable for a humanoid robot literally none so we had to develop our own design design it specifically for for what a humanoid robot needs it is designed to be manufactured in the same way they would make a car and i think ultimately we can make optimus for less than the cost of a car it should be because if you look at the mass of the robot it's much smaller and the car has many actuators in it the car has more actuators than the robot <laughs> And they could do some interesting manipulation, soft, yeah. soft touch robotics. I mean, one of the test uh, goals I have is can it, can it pick up a needle and a thread and thread the needle just by looking? How far away are we from that? Just by looking, just by looking. Uh, maybe a year. Hmm. Although I go back to I'm optimistic on time. The work that we're doing in the car will translate to the robot. The perception or the also the control? The No, the controls are different, but the... The video in controls out. Mm -hmm. um, the The car is a robot on four wheels. The 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 Optimus is a robot with hands and legs. So you but, can just they're they're very they're very similar. So the entire machinery of the learning process, yeah. end to end, is just you just have a different set of controls. Optimus will figure out how to do things by watching videos. As the saying goes, "Be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about." Yeah, it's true. What's something difficult you're going through that people don't often see? Trying to feed Uber Lilith. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, my mind is a storm, and I, I don't think, I don't think most people would want to be me. They may think they'd want to be me, but they don't. They don't know. They don't understand. Um, how are you doing? I mean, overall, okay. In the grand scheme of things, I can't complain. Do you get lonely? Sometimes, but I, you know, my kids and friends keep me company. So not existential. There are many nights I sleep alone. I don't have to, but I do. What is forgiveness? I do not, at least I don't think I harbor resentment. Um, So, nothing to forgive. I mean, I try to think about like what 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 is going to affect the future in a good way, um, and holding on to grudges mm -hmm. does not affect the future in a good way. I mean, developing AI and watching say a little X grow is uh, fascinating uh, because they 
there are far more parallels than I would have expected. I mean, I can see his biological neural net making more and more sense of the world. And I can see the digital neural net making more and more sense of the world at the same time. Do you see the beauty and magic in both? Yes. I mean, one of the things with, with kids is that, uh, you know, you, you kind of see the world anew in their eyes. Um, you know, to them, everything is new and fresh. And, um, and then when you, when you see that them experience them, the world is new and fresh, you do too. This is the Lex Free Podcast.